year, as you know, every year we've been doing Right to Know and our annual safety training. We've added the piece last year of the AWARE, um, which stands for you know, Workplace Accident and Injury Reduction Programs required by the state of Minnesota. So what we've done is more of an overhead view of all three of these. Some points in here I'm going to talk a little bit about if you want more information, a little bit more in the weeds. I'll be referring you to public health on some of those things because I don't think that we need to have a full in-depth discussion of all of the nitty-gritty pieces of that. Oh, it works. Yay. Okay. Also, if you've never done training with me, I don't read slides. So I'm just going to have you read those and I'll do talking outside of it. Obviously, we have a lot of objectives. Number one objective is you can't avoid a hazard if you can't identify it. So we're going to talk about that. The other thing you'll hear, hear me say over and over and over again is about communication. We as a safety committee, we as a county can't fix a hazard unless you tell us about it. We were an active safety committee. We're both very, all very active and busy in trying to prevent it, injuries and um, unsafe conditions. But we're not anywhere you work every day. So if you see things, I encourage you to communicate with us about it. SDS is? SDS used to be called an MSDS. It stands for a safety data sheet. We'll talk about that right here. So what a safety data sheet is, is what you see here is, of course, spilled toner, something that a lot of us use in the office place. These things seem innocuous and har harmless enough, but they have a lot of different chemicals in them. There could be issues, there could be irritations, there could be allergens. So an SDS is a sheet that talks about what's in it, who makes it, emergency treatment, what to look for, manufacturers, clean up, all of those things. In this building, in the courthouse, your SDS is going to be located in the maintenance <coughs> office. That's also going to be the location in the office building. It's downstairs in the maintenance office. What I really encourage is before you mess with something you haven't messed with before, check out an SDS first. Make sure you shouldn't be wearing PPE, personal protective equipment. Or if you need to have hazards, make sure you know what you're touching in case you may have a personal allergy to it as well. Hazardous substances, obviously we want to Anytime we're doing something new, we want to make sure we know what it is, how it can affect us, how to handle it safely, if we need any of that PPE. Something that definitely with the supervisor, it's their responsibility to make sure you know what you're handling and how to do it safely. So if you're not sure of something or something new, ask the question. You know, is there something I need with this? What do I need to know about it? If it comes into here. It's your responsibility to know what you're handling. If you don't, ask your supervisor. Ask, and they may send you to building maintenance. They may send you somewhere else. But make sure that you are aware of what you're doing, how you're doing it, and what you're handling before you do that. Okay? This is a big thing for me. Um, some of you may or may not know, prior to coming to the county, I was actually in safety and manufacturing environment as well as HR. And I'm very, very big on labels. Any idea what that is? The unknown bottle here, we've had a lot of guesses. Could be olive oil because it's by sugar. For all we know, could be a urine sample or gasoline. We have no, could be pine salt. We have no idea. At the county, a lot of times we'll buy things, especially cleaning agents and some of those other substances and doing large containers to save dollars. And then we put them in what's called a secondary container. Secondary container is anything that's not originally done by the manufacturer, okay? So if you'll put that into a secondary container, you need to make sure you're properly labeling exactly what it is. I've seen this happen before, is that something's not marked, they think they know what it is, so what happens a lot of times when there's a liquid and you're not quite sure what it is, what do you do? Throw away. A lot of people sniff it. Oh. I've seen some people open it up, take a whiff. Let's see if I can figure out what that is. Yeah. Smells like gasoline. Exactly. What if it was something much more noxious? Now you're inhaling something that you shouldn't be inhaling. Really important. If you find something that's not labeled, don't use it. Don't throw it away because it may be dangerous to throw it away. But let somebody else in building maintenance or somewhere somebody. else. Go ahead. Some we deal with more in the office, some less. Some we'll deal more with when we're out in the field. 
some of the people in highway and law enforcement deal with more. We're just going to do, again, that general overview of our different types of hazards. Here's one you may typically see in the highway department with the welding. But we all deal with, you know, noise issues. For example, Mike, you're out in the field a lot. You're out in the field a lot, too. All of those different things. Heat, cold, even in the office buildings. We see people with their sweaters and their blankets and their heaters and their fans. So we're all dealing with all of those different things that can cause issues for us. This is where I'm going to do a real general overview. And if you have more specific information or questions that you want to get, I'm going to refer you to public health. They have a wealth of knowledge and a lot of materials if these are things that you're concerned about. So, but knowing that we are exposed to infectious agents is important. Just a few terms to make sure that you're comfortable with the terminology when it comes to different infectious agents. And a big one to remember, modes of transmission and modes of entry. That even if you work in an office building or in specific homes or outside, the things can get, we can get the things and we can give things in a lot of different ways. Okay? We know we're all down going with this. We all luckily work in a county where they provide a flu shot for us every year, which I highly recommend. Because um, we never know who's walking in the door and what wonderful bug they're bringing with them and sharing with us because we're good Minnesotans and we share. So, something to definitely take advantage of if at all possible. Bacterial, you know, some of you outside people are going to deal with more of the deer ticks and that kind of thing. Um, equipment services, office services, solid waste. One of the things that I always point out with this piece, and it comes in a little bit with bloodborne pathogens and bodily fluids as well, is if there's a spill of something and you do not know or have not been trained on how to clean it up, it may seem like not a big deal, but make sure that you're getting someone who knows how to do it properly, who has the correct protective equipment. We don't just walk away and not tell anybody about it, of course. Your officers says you'll want to keep clean on your own, of course, but then I'm talking about members of the public come in. Things spill, people bleed, children have accidents, things happen. So make sure that if you see those kinds of things, you're referring it to someone who's been trained in cleaning up bodily fluids, bloodborne pathogens, and so forth to minimize your risk of infection. And then parasitic, the one in the offices that we probably deal with the most is lice. Because once again, we don't know what people from the public are walking in with and being ever so good and sharing with us. A lot of you people that are outside and working in the outdoors or out in the public are dealing with domesticated animals, potentially fleas, potentially ticks, and a lot of those other fun organisms. Overall safety program, we're going to go through some of the goals in controlling hazards. You're going to see that word communication again. I'm going to say that a lot. Um, safety committee that I'm very, very proud of. Of the five years I've been here, this year is the fourth year that we have actually won the Governor's Safety Award. So that says that everybody is being conscientious about safety and that we're doing a pretty good job. Could we do better? Always. Until we have a zero year of anything, we can always do better. And the other thing I want to point out too is with investigations, goes with communication because we do investigate every single thing that's reported to us. And the enforcement piece, all I want to say about that really is that when people say rule, see rule enforcement, they think punishment, they think discipline, they think those kinds of things which makes people hesitant to want to report issues, concerns, and so forth. That's not what we're talking about with regard to rule enforcement. Yes, if you are blatantly disregarding the safety rules and are causing a hazard to other people, we're probably going to have a chat. Other than that, what we're talking about with rule enforcement is, let's say Cindy falls and hurts herself, we're going to want to know to see if it was something we need to fix that caused that fall, if maybe she needed to be retrained on how to do whatever it is that caused her fall, is there another hazard we're not aware of? Making sure that we're sticking by those things. Do I need to remind her of a, of a specific safety rule that could maybe mitigate or eliminate that hazard next time? That's what I mean with regard to rule enforcement. Just going over a few of the goals. I like this one in here because it talks about a lot of different areas. Slip strips and falls, the number one cause of workplace injury in the nation. The ergonomic one, I like in here too because a lot of people think of ergonomics as more wellness than safety. Ergonomics are very big to avoid what's called repetitive strain injuries by how you're sitting, how you're holding your arms, how you're doing your functions. 
And then, of course, please don't be the person that has to sniff your food to see if it's still good before you eat it. If you're not sure, please just don't. With this one is safety culture, and that's what we've been working really hard over the past several years to build. What I mean by a safety culture isn't just I'm following the safety rules and doing my job. Okay, that's fine. What I'm talking about is star, I see you're running up the stairs with both your hands full. Hey, why don't I get the elevator for you? Or why don't I help you carry that thing so you can hold the handrail? You know, Mike, that box looks really big. Why don't I help you with it? Or how about I get the doors? Being conscientious of others and being able to speak safety so that everyone's thinking about it, that's more of a safety culture of saying, you know what? You did that really difficult thing really well. Can you show me how you did that so I can do it safely too? That's a safety culture, and that's what we're always working on improving in the county. And of course, my ultimate goal is for this number down here to be a big old zero, and nobody got hurt, nobody had anything, life was perfect. The goal of a safety program in my eyes is that every employee then gets to go home in as good or better condition than they came to work. That, to me, is the point of a safety program. That's the end result goal. So we do these trainings and we talk about safety for that reason. I don't want you to miss out on your life, on the things with your family, with your friends, <coughs> because of something that happened at work. And then of course our targeted training. This is part of that. But this isn't the only targeted training you're gonna do. Again, it comes back to that. Hey, here's a new function. Let's talk about how to do that safely. Here's a new product. Let's make sure you know how to handle it safely, what's in it in case you have allergens. Lots of resources on the intranet, for those of you that have intranet access, for those of you that don't. There's lots of resources in the Human Resources Office. Um, re videos, uh, documents, contacts, action plans, all of those different kinds of things are available to you there. All right, controlling hazards. This just sort of talks about how we do that. Number one thing, once again, can't do anything about a hazard if it's not identified and communicated to us. That's why on the intranet, you'll find in the forms tab a place to notate an unsafe or unhealthful work environment or work situation. If you see something, fill it out, send it to me. Grab a safety committee member, grab your supervisor, grab your department head, grab me. Hey, I saw this, it happened today. I was setting up in room 108, Jeff Cooper was helping me set something up and pointed out, hey, the uh, cover box for all of our outlets is broken. Well, that's a safety hazard on a number of levels. So we can get that working. Didn't know about it. Apparently it's been broken for a couple weeks. Didn't know about it. So now we can do something about it. Everything, again, that's brought to us goes to the safety committee. It's given a ranking according to the Minnesota Health Department and Safety Division of the severity. We work on corrective measures. Obviously, our number one goal is to eliminate the hazard. You can't always eliminate all hazards. If we can't eliminate it, then we work out a plan to mitigate it or minimize it as much as possible. And it stays on our agenda until it has come all the way through to completion. So every meeting, we're talking about that same one. Where is it at now? How is that mitigation working? Until it comes to a place of being completely closed, it stays there and it's focused on. Just a map to review a little bit. There'll be some questions later that are really important to know. You know, the question is, do you know where the eyewash stations are? Do you know where the fire extinguishers are? We had a case here a year and a half, two years ago. Somebody got something in their eyes. And the first thing I noticed as it was happening was that the smartest thing they did in the whole world was not go and try and find the eyewash station themselves while they have something blinding in their eyes. They grabbed a person and said, help me get to the eyewash station. Do you know where the eyewash station is? If that person grabs you and says, KK, I got something in my eyes, can you help me get to the eyewash station? If it were me, I surely hope if I grab Cindy's arm that she knows where she's going and that's not the time she says, let me look at the map. So know where those things are. So that that person could be you, it could be one of your coworkers that's saying, help me. If you're in the office building, we have the same map for the office building. Something to refresh yourself with and just kind of know where those different things are. Moving into AWARE, which is very similar um, to what we were previously simply calling, calling our overall safety program. You 
to see a lot of things that are uh, similar to some of the things we talked about. Communication, hazard identification, roles and responsibilities. All of those pieces that we were just talking about are a part of that AWARE program and a part of that document. And then the roles and responsibilities, oops, roles and responsibilities <coughs> as well. We each have our own responsibilities. We can hold our supervisors and department heads and managers accountable for their responsibilities as well. We make sure these things are done. We're going to be doing more measures so that we can see that it's established and that these are being taken seriously and effectively. We have a lot of different safety rules. Some are county specific, some are department specific. I don't necessarily need safety rules on how to do an inspection because I don't do inspections. But these two gentlemen do. I don't necessarily need rules on how to do more of the lifting and twisting kinds of things because I'm not in people's homes. But you do. So we're each going to have some things as far as people that are very irate and how to keep myself safe. That's something you deal with on a daily basis. So some of those things are going to be very department specific. Some are going to be county wide. Housekeeping, housekeeping, housekeeping. When we do safety inspections, that is probably the number one thing that gets marked. And what I mean by housekeeping isn't, is your desk polished? It's do you have the cord for your heater running across that you're going to trip on? Do you have things piled up so high on your desk that as you walk by, they're going to fall down on you and either hurt you by falling or creating a trip for you? Those are the kinds of housekeeping things we're talking about. Do you have your tools and stuff that are blocking your way to the door so that it's a stub your foot or a trip on hazard? That's what we're talking about, about housekeeping in an office setting. And there's that reporting again. Report, 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 report. Again, we have a form for this, but if you're not big on filling out a form, contact me, email me, call me. Just let me know, whatever it takes. Again, you can do verbal or written. How, whatever it takes to get it communicated. PPE is something that a lot of us are going to have to use on different occasions. For most of us in an office setting, probably the most common thing we would use would probably be um, gloves for something. Different times, you might need a mask. You might need, like our maintenance people have the very bright colored jackets for when they're out in the parking lots doing work. You guys are going to have things when you're out in the field. Not only do you need to use it, because it really isn't going to help you unless you wear it, but it's also almost going to do more damage than good if you don't use it properly. If you need to wear a mask for something, even if it's just one of those little ones with the metal, if you're not fitting it properly, you're giving yourself the false impression that you're protected, which is almost more dangerous than having no protection at all. So make sure you know how to use it and how to fit it. If it's starting to wear, stop using it, it's not protecting you. Tell your supervisor, get another one. Whatever you need to do with that, replace it, get it repaired. All of those different pieces. But PPE is, the number one thing with PPE is, it doesn't work if you don't wear it. And report, 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 report. Big thing with these, a lot of people don't like to report things, oh, it was just minor. I slipped in my chair, fell on the floor, not a big deal, I'm not gonna do anything, okay? Well, that's fine, but what happens when two, three, four days later, you're still having a lot of pain, and now I end up going to the doctor to find out I cracked my coccyx? Well, now you're trying, talking about a work-related injury that you haven't reported, and what if the reason you fell on that chair is because your mat was bad, and we should have replaced that days ago. So even those small things, you're not gonna get in trouble for it. We're gonna send it in. They're gonna list it as a record only. But then if something comes up later from that incident, we've got it. Work comp through MCIT, who manages our work comp process. They've got it on file. So if you do end up going to the doctor, and you call and say, hey, KK, you know, when I turned in that form the other day, when I slipped out of my chair, thought the only thing I bruised was my ego. Well, not so much. Okay, we can expedite these things now because everything's in process. Plus, if you're not reporting it, I don't know what happened. And what if four or five other people are having the same issue that I don't know what happened? I look for patterns when I see these to see if, you know, this type of chair seems to be slipping out from underneath people a lot. We wouldn't know that unless everyone was reporting it. Okay? That's one of the reasons it's so important. The other piece is, we'll talk about a little bit too and later on as well, 
because near misses. People hate reporting near misses because they're like, well, nothing really happened. But if you think of all the mirrors that we have in different buildings on corners, those all came about because of near misses. We're almost running into each other when we're coming around these corners because it's blind. Well, if we didn't know that was happening, it's a simple fix. You install a mirror, all better. By the way, they don't work unless you're looking at it. If you're stirring your coffee as you're walking, the mirrors don't work very well. So. These are important things that help us avoid and eliminate injuries. So. And there's that near miss reporting. The other one that we do is the safety inspections. We actually do two safety inspections in every department every year. One of them is done by the department head or division leader, and they go around and do one of their own department. We're currently in the process right now where our safety committee member goes to the department head that is not their department. Because a lot of times you know how it is. It happens in your own home. You have this thing that's been there. And at first you're like, oh, i got to do something about that. But you get busy. And then it's been there so long, and you get to the point where you don't even see it anymore. It's just there. And, but if somebody goes, did you realize there's a hole in your rug there, and you're stepping over, almost tripping on it all the time? I forgot all about it, even though you're looking at it every day. That's why we send safety people to departments that aren't theirs. It's that fresh set of eyes are going to see the things that we have now become blind to. And then we do job hazard analysis, analyses. What this one is, is if you have a process within your job that you feel concerned about, that you think that there's some hazards that need to be mitigated, you would contact my office. We would go through that process step by step. This is the first step. This is what needs to get done. Here are the potential hazards. How can we eliminate or mitigate it? The next step in the process is this. It's a very in the weeds, broken down analysis, generally used for jobs that are much more hazardous, depending. Um, but if at any time you feel that you need that done for a specific job, a specific process, let me know. I'm happy to work through that with you. And there's my favorite word again, is the communication. We're doing our training. We're doing our right to know. that safety committee meets every other month, but they're available all the time. Anybody know a safety committee member? I don't count because you all know it's me. Terry. Who else is on the safety committee? Terry. Terry. Susan. Susan. Who? Martin. Mark. Martin. Martin. Oh, John Martin. Yes. Chocolate all around. I give chocolate for answers, you know. As the safety person for his chocolate. Yeah. <laughs> yep, John Martin's on the safety committee. Jason Marquardt in the other building is on the safety committee. Um, from LELS, we have Phil Whitaker. From our local 49ers, we have Ken Rizla. Um, we are going to be replacing, we lost one safety committee member. We'll be looking at replacing that person. I'm actually looking for someone from the office building because they only have one representative right now. But those are people to grab and talk to about your different concerns and thoughts. This just gives you a basic idea of how we do an accident investigation. I am involved in all accident investigations. Um, I've had specific training with regard to that. We look for what's called root cause analysis, which is basically, here's what happened. Well, why did it happen? This came here. Well, why did that come here? And you go backwards and backwards and backwards and backwards until you get all the way back to what actually was that first domino that caused the accident. It's the best way to eliminate and mitigate hazards. Because if you're just looking at, she fell on a chair, there's not much you can do about that other than say, be careful when you're sitting down. If you start going backwards, you may find it's got a bad wheel. You may find that the mat's too slippery. You may find different things if you're going backwards. And then the enforcement. It's a scary word for people because everyone's afraid of discipline. This is not about blame. This is not about pointing fingers. This is about making sure that you have the tools you need to be safe. All right. So here's what I'm going to do. This is the trivia time. You're sitting in where you normally work every day. This is going to be a little bit trickier for you. You can think about some of the places you normally work. Where's the closest exit out of the building from where you normally sit? That door? Or is it for you? Depends. Those upstairs you, you doors? Upstairs or down. You have your own door. Do you know where the exits are in every one of the homes you go to? Yeah. Okay. So, what if that exit's unavailable? Where's your secondary, second closest exit? Upstairs. Upstairs, no. Well, or you could go straight down. Mm -hmm. Yep. 
really necessary out the window. Out the window? <laughs> Where's your other exit? Down the stairs. Okay. In the direction. Where do we meet if there's a fire in this building? Down the parking lot down the Isn't it down behind the building over here? The Riscow building? Yes. That's actually our secondary spot. The reason we went there, and the other class did it too. The reason we went there for our last fire drill was because they were doing road construction on our path. So we went to our secondary, which is what we would do if there was a fire and we had difficulty accessing our primary. Our primary is the parking lot of the servicemen's club for this building. Our secondary is behind the Ristow building. So, yes and yes. <coughs> All right, do you know what the nearest fire extinguisher is to you? Because when something small catches on fire that isn't necessarily an evacuate the building thing, do you know where it is? It's also not a good time to have to look at a map. Do you know where they are? Front lobby. That's an AED. Do you have a fire extinguisher? Oh yeah, you do have a fire extinguisher outside the store. Yeah. If you're not 100% sure, look. That's not a good time to have to stop and look at a map saying, oh, there's a fire. Where's a map? You mean I can't put a fire out that <laughs> No. Yeah. Do you know where your first aid kits are? In the mm -hmm. mail room. Mail room. Yep. In the office building, they're in several locations because they have a lot more secured, locked areas. There's also one in Auditor Treasurer's if you're upstairs in New York and AEDs. Here's my plug in the AEDs. As you all know, the AEDs are very near and dear to my heart. Um, these AEDs, we're, we're, there's a discussion about the hope of offering CPR AED training to all employees on a two-year rotating basis. If you have not had AED training and you are there with that person who drops, don't not grab the AED if you at all feel comfortable doing that. These AEDs, one of the reasons we chose these specific units is because one, you take it off, it shows you exactly where to place it at. If it doesn't get a good reading, it's going to tell you to replace it. Okay? As you're doing compressions, if you're not doing them hard enough, it's going to tell you to push harder. It's going to tell you to stop doing compressions so that it can check a person. And you can stick those pads in me and push that shock button all day long. It will not send a shock unless the unit reads a shock is needed. So you don't have to worry about accidentally shocking somebody. It will not let you do it. That's, I think, people's number one fear of touching those things. I'm afraid I'm going to shock them and I shouldn't, and I'm going to kill them. You can't with these units. That's one of the reasons why we wanted these specific units. Okay? Now, granted, I encourage you to get CPR ADD training if that's something that you're at all remotely interested in. I know you guys don't have a choice in that, and you have to do it. A lot of us don't that are in the offices. I would encourage you to consider it. But even without it, that's why we have these units. And those first couple minutes, even though paramedics for us are a block away, that block away could make all the difference. Okay? So something to be thinking about when you're looking at those units. But I really encourage you, think about those things. You know, know what's going to happen. Yes, we have drills, but have we had a drill where all of a sudden one of the doors doesn't work? Maybe the fire's right outside my crown crown's door. So that's not going to be a good way to go. So what are you going to do? Think about those things before it happens. Again, the map is not something to look at when the emergency happens. We're already there, guys. So the biggest thing, you know, communicate, communicate, communicate. I will work diligently on any safety issue because I don't want to see anyone hurt ever. But I can't do that unless I know. Okay? Know what's going on. Ask for information. Ask for training. Use PPE when you need to use it. And know where your stuff is. These maps have recently been updated because some things have moved and changed with different secure doors and everything else. So if you haven't looked at the maps in a while, Take another peek at it real quickly. Think through that. You know, maybe the door that you were thinking you were going to go through isn't quite as accessible as it used to be. 
Maybe a fire extinguisher has been taken out because there was problems with it. All right? Are there any questions? One, one thing we've talked about in our office quite well over probably the last five, six, seven years, I know. Um, Dyke came down one time and we talked about the meth labs and being aware of those. Right. And it, it was going to be communicated somehow not to go places. That hasn't happened. Right. And I do know that was brought up at our other training as well. Um, and I'll talk to you about that a little bit when we're, when we're done with the class. Because there, there is some follow up I'll give you with that piece. Okay. Yeah. So I think the, the big problem is, is from a work top standpoint, other yep, there's a lot of conflicting issues with that. Yep, absolutely. But what I'm what makes me feel good is that you guys are all still having the dialogue. And that's the important thing, is that we're still saying we're identifying a hazard. Let's talk about it. So any other questions? Well then thank you. That's all we have for today. Thank you. Thanks. We covered these already, so yeah. Yeah.